Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Origin Story, where we dive into how your favorite YouTubers got started and where they're going. I'm Mike. And I'm JP. And today we're joined by Cam Anderson of Blacktail Studios. Hey. How are we welcome, doing, Cam? Cam? Doing good. Thanks for having me. Excellent. Yeah. We're, we're super excited about this. And, and for those who don't know Cam, Cam is the man behind the channel Blacktail Studio. His channel special specializes in the utilization of native hardwoods, salvaged lumber, and upcycled materials to craft custom furniture, home decor, and unique gifts. You should check out his Etsy page because the things that he has on there are amazingly beautiful pieces of art that you can put in your home, your office, anything that you would want to do with them or just look at them, you know? He's also a helicopter pilot, a husband, a father to his four-legged son, Riggs, and a cat named Turkey, which JP just loves the idea that you named your cat Turkey. Um, check out his channel to be inspired for your next woodworking project and join his community of over 760,000 subscribers. His 88 videos have been watched almost 84 million times. Think about that real quick because that's almost 1 million views per uh, episode you put up, which is something that is really unheard of i mean that's wild and so for those listening you can tune in on thursdays to see another amazing project by cam and get inspired to go out and build something on your own cam thank you so much for being on the podcast we're really excited to tell your origin story wow that, that was quite an intro i, I like the uh the deep dive you you, you did good and i I'd never done the math on the the videos and the views per video well, we'll dive into the the numbers later because there are some amazing things on on like the your especially on how many views you have in such a short period of time and the growth that you've seen and just like the the sheer number of of you know views on some of the videos you have you know you've broken some amazing thresholds that we really haven't seen in oh on 50 episodes so congratulations on the 50th episode as well thank you for being our 50th guest Wow. Congrats to you guys. Thanks. Yeah, it was really yeah, thanks exciting. For, uh, thanks for being here. And I mean, just like quick intro for those who are listening in, you know, um, it's kind of, uh, it's great. It's kind of dual purpose, obviously. Um, you know, Cam went to Oregon State, uh, graduated from Oregon State University. I as well went to Oregon State University. So big love for Oregon, um, big love for YouTube. And while I'm not a woodworker, I, for some, whatever reason, watch a whole lot of woodworking um, and like a boxy table building on YouTube, which is bizarre. It's something I don't do, but um, had to reach out to you and we're, we're, we're so happy to have you here and just kind of chat through and kind of talk about your origin stories like what what made you get here to where we are today so thank you again for coming on and chatting with us um, I, I guess like let, let's kind of start with that Oregon piece I mean tell us a little bit about kind of growing up um, you know where, where you grew up and um, we'll go from there sure yeah I, I was born in Oregon grew up in uh, you'll know it, but most people won't I grew up in Albany which is close to Corvallis where Oregon State is yeah um, Moved around a little bit, but pretty much within Oregon the whole time. Uh, graduated in 2000, which is uh, 27 years ago. Uh, <laughs> then went to Oregon State, graduated in 2004. And uh, from there, I got a degree. And then just like a lot of kids, I just didn't know what to do with it. Just uh, hung out in Corvallis for another four or five years bartending. <laughs> Yeah. And that's and not a, not a bad move, you know, as you figured out, but like, take us back. Like, was, was there anything from your childhood? Was it, would you spend a lot of time outdoors? Like what kind of got you into this, you know, obviously, you know, you go to Oregon state, you get a fish, fisheries and wildlife degree. Um, like tell me about growing up there. Were you around kind of that, you know um, I guess like forestry type environment, logging those things like that. Sure. So, so my dad was a game warden. He was a st state trooper for, for, pushing 30 years whatever it was so we grew up a lot around the outdoors um and yeah I've, I've always I always liked making stuff I always tinkered with stuff my dad he wasn't necessarily a woodworker but he was you know been around construction and he's the guy that would just do dad thing just you know if you need a shed built you just build a shed and I'm like but how do you how do you know how to do it and you just figure it out and I've always kind of liked that motto of just figuring it out yeah, yeah that's awesome Gordon. That's pretty, that's a pretty cool career path. And so was your intention to follow that with your major? Yeah. Yeah. He got a degree in fish and wildlife too. And so my, my theory in going to college was I'll start studying something I like because I love animals. I'm very interested in animals and then we'll worry about how I apply it later. And it's one of those things when you're, you know, you're a freshman, you think I got four years to figure it out. And then, you know, you're sophomore, you're like, I got two years to figure it out. And then pretty soon you're like, 
I got a term to figure it out. And so mm-hmm. didn't end up going that route. I, I grew up, I wanted to be a cop. That was, you know, what I always wanted to be growing up and didn't go that route. And gosh, it's, I, I imagine my life would be a little different right now if I had. Very much yeah. so. Yeah. It, it, but you know what? There are some very successful police uh, and wildlife enthusiast channels on YouTube. So you could have found your way back to YouTube in a different route. There's a, do you guys, do you guys know Johnny Builds? Yeah. Yeah. He's a, he's a detective apparently. And he has, you know, 600,000 subscribers or something in the woodworking niche. That's wild. It, it's, yeah. it's interesting. I guess he turned his hobby into a, you know, a secondary mm-hmm. form of income. And I guess like the police industry, we're going down a deep path, but you get like, you get kind of like uh, that four on to three off kind of working career where you might work like four days in a row and then you have three days off or something like that. So I guess it makes sense to have a great mm-hmm. hobby to do while you're at home. Well, that was, that was the whole thing with when I became a pilot after uh, my bartending career was over is I had seven days on then I had seven days off. And so I kind of just had to do something in that time. And woodworking was, was what I filled that, that hole with. Yeah. So, well, let's, real quick, just to jump back to bartending, yeah. where did you bartend in Corvallis? Cause this is very important. <laughs> yeah, it's critical. It's uh, Cl- at Claude's. Oh, you were at Claude's. Okay. Yeah. Um, hopefully it didn't toss me out at any point in time very likely that you might have um there's, you never know I, I've, yeah there's 50 50 but I've, I've been tossed out of there too so it's fine yeah Claude's, <laughs> i mean that's a it's a and, and for the for the uninitiated mike uh Claude's is a is a pretty big uh bar down there in corbell so it's a, it's up there so um yeah no i i, I had to know that i, I did uh, i did bartending at the upper deck sports park the indoor soccer center there uh in corvallis for a couple of years oh. and that was a, that was a real treat so nice. um love nice. that well like and so let's talk about this so you i mean you, you graduate right or you, you know you go to oregon state and as we do you kind of figure things out and do what you want to do and then um did did you you said you did the bartending and then now we, we're talking about the helicopter pilot what got you into this were you always into flying like what how did you sure sure so yeah when i when i was a pilot people would always ask me like oh did you grow up wanting to fly or did you love this and i was like no no not at all so uh how i got into it was there was a guy bartended with at claude's he was a pilot and he went to uh he moved to dallas to take this corporate job corporate job job and he's like dating a dallas mavericks cheerleader and like he's working as his private pilot for this billionaire and i'm like this is this is awesome like i want to be like this guy and i didn't know that was super rare in the pilot world for like how he did um but that was oh i first got into it he did airplanes i'm like i don't know i think helicopters would be kind of neat and so um that was how i first you know thought about it and did some research and was like yeah, I want to go be a pilot. So you immediately took the more difficult route, and instead of going with fixed wing, you went with uh, helicopter. <laughs> yeah, I guess. I mean, it, it, everything's everything's easy once you know how. So. Yeah, um, and so so what you so this guy he kind of he kind of had this glamorous idea, and you said, all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna go give it a shot. Yeah, pretty much, and uh, I was able to do it while I you know continued to bartend, so I could just fly in the days and go to work at night, and did that for um about a year and a half i think to get all my licenses and then i um you become a flight instructor is kind of what everybody does when they start flying and uh I, you have to build a lot of time you just got to build this experience and there nobody was flying in corvallis and so i just kind of had to take a chance and applied for a job online in houston area and the guy called and talked once or twice then he called back and said how soon can you be here and i lived in oregon my whole life and i was like two weeks notice and a three-day drive and he's like all right we'll see you then that's crazy yeah, and you talk and you talk about that um and i and i've heard it in one of your one of your videos um but essentially you went down kind of like you had the offer you went down and you kind of like halfway there realized like oh i don't even know i don't even know what i'm getting paid i don't No, yeah yeah i i, I didn't even well, ask send. him and yeah as, as i got as i was literally driving down i'm like never actually discussed if or what I'll be getting paid. And I, you don't make much. So I was like, the guy will have to probably be a real jerk not to like, give me something like, you know, reasonable. And he was fine. He was, he did, it was, again, I wasn't getting rich, but he was totally fair with me. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. I'm, I'm got to work out. Cause I mean, it sounds like um, just from, from what you did is you went down there and you got a, a lot more opportunity to go fly, whether it's like, you know, being in the Pacific Northwest, we're not known for our weather. So you were able to go down there and what build hours and what, what was the ultimate goal there of that, that, you know, going down there. Just really to 
build time you know do you want to learn to fly and I, I did I learned a lot from him I learned a lot from just that area like you said the weather's different thunderstorms you know I never really we, we have thunderstorms here you know three times a year but they have them all year just right. constantly there so I asked uh the rule up that they tell you when you're in flight school is they're like oh you stay within don't go within 20 miles of a thunderstorm Okay. And I asked him when I started there, I was like, so about 20 miles, we got to stay from the thunderstorms. And he just laughed. He's like, you won't fly all summer. And I'm like, Oh, what? And he goes, just don't go in them. And I'm like, Oh, okay. So, uh, yeah, I did that. And then the next path after, uh, you build time doing that is most people go to either the grand Canyon and fly tours, or they go into the Gulf of Mexico, fly out to the oil rigs. And that's yeah. what I did. I went and flew offshore. And when you're flying, like, it must have been much different flying too, because you know, in Oregon, there's a lot of you know mountains and valleys and uh, rivers and kind of things like that. Where when you go to Houston, Texas, uh, I think it's probably the same as Florida. The biggest mountain is the trash pile, right? Yeah. So, yeah. so you really do get to see all of the context of where it is. And so, how was that that change of of scenery for you? It was it was tough because I'm not people i'm not great with directions in general and people think like how could you be a pilot i'm like we get a that's, a great, to... that's a great thing for your helicopter pilot to say by the way <laughs> oh, I used to tell that all the time. <laughs> yeah and uh, but it's true i'm not and uh, but you don't think about it when you're especially in the willamette valley like you know we have a small mountain range and a big mountain range and yep. north south you know so if you kind of always know which way you're going and i pop up down there and you get up and you're completely disoriented because it's just flat everywhere right. and so um, and there's a lot of, uh, busy, busy airspace, you know, it's a big deal to go into like, at least it was a big deal for me back then to go into a Delta airspace, which is Salem. Like, that's just like nothing. And down there you have two Bravos, which is, we don't even have one. Portland's not even a Bravo. And so you got to learn how to navigate between all that. So it was, it was a steep learning curve and it was, it was stressful. It was the first time in my life. I feel like I'd ever actually been stressed. Like I had a pretty, pretty easy life up to that point. Yeah. Were you just moving like, so when you transferred over and you started doing this, like, you know, whether it's like a contract or whatever, was it a contract, I guess you did with these oil rigs? So yeah, when I got hired at off, offshore, you work for a helicopter company and they're, and they sell contracts to the oil companies. Yep. Okay. So then I would, you, you, I try, you, you want to get on with one of the good oil companies. Cause you're kind of like, it's kind of like a family out there. And so I was usually um, pretty good at kind of forced my way into the, the, the good places just, if you get a, if you get a chance to fly for them one day, you just try to make friends and keep tabs with them, and it's just networking like anything. And then yeah. they can request you to be their permanent pilot. What what kind of what kind of uh, helicopters are you flying out there? Like, uh, not you're not you're not doing like the tour helicopter of the Grand Canyon where it's like the back seat and two front seats. It's you're it's the, they're they're not the they're not the same, but they're same size, same kind of class okay. that the, the Grand Canyon. So I, I was flying. There's all kinds of you can fly anywhere from you know, five seaters up to 20 seaters offshore. And, um, I flew the, um, the, the small ships, just the si single engine, one propeller, um, six people, I think usually six passenger. Wow. Yeah. Uh, that's pretty cool. It, is there to become a helicopter pilot? Do you need to have any training in planes or you can just kind of be like, I'm just going to be a helicopter pilot. And that's the only focus you go into. Yeah, it's it's totally separate. There 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 is some overlap. I got my airplane license just to or airplane certificate. If anybody's watching, that's really particular about the verbiage. Um, <laughs> there, those people are out there. Um, but yeah, I got my I got my certificate just to have it because it wasn't that many more hours just to go do that. Um, but I would be super dangerous in an airplane. I I haven't flown in years. Yeah, that would be a that'd be a wild ride, especially somewhere where you don't have any orientation of where you're going. But now you're back in the yeah. Pacific Northwest and you have you have your your mountains back understanding which direction your cardinal is back. So um, yeah. that's pretty cool. Um, Do you still question on the on those oil rigs? Like um just because I know it can get pretty crazy out there. Mike and I are both uh just a random um corner of the YouTube world that we live in is uh just big, just big waves anywhere, big wave surfing. You, you did you see a lot of like crazy storms and things like that when you're out there on those rigs? Um some pretty good ones, probably not like you guys they're thinking um if you get to 20 feet like pretty much the whole gulf shuts down like if somebody 50 miles away reports a 20 foot you know at, at one of the rigs they shut down and you know when you're getting into hurricane season everything's shut down and we'd get you know 
I don't know what a big swell is to you, but you know, when we, cause I'd live out off there for basically a week at a time or yeah, 10 days or so. Yeah. And you know, 10, 15 feet wasn't too uncommon, but we're not flying during that. Everything's strapped down. Yeah. Yeah. Especially in the Gulf. Cause it's, it, it's its own, you know, the, the floor of the Gulf is very strange, you know, especially around yeah. Florida and everything. So it, it is a pretty good drop off there were, they can't really hold that big swell. I mean, Florida in general can't. There's not really. Well, it's it, it's it's weird. I was normally western Louisiana, kind of east east Texas area, and um, I would we lived about or lived our our rig was usually about ninety miles out, ninety about one hundred and ten regular miles out, mm -hmm. and it was only two hundred feet of water. So, but if you get to like New Orleans, like the Deepwater Horizon was like fifty miles out, which it's really weird. So on that other side, it drops off like super dramatically. But where I was, we were pretty shallow. Yeah. And even on Florida, like off of Jupiter, which is basically the, the little bit in the southern side of it, uh, southeast side, their drop off is like only four miles, five miles offshore. So it's weird how oh, that really? whole shelf comes throughout the whole valley. Yeah, it's, it's wild. I mean, the ocean bases are, are so cool. I mean, I, there's a great YouTube uh, video on Nazare, I don't know if you like like the the bottom of the ocean, but it explains like how these hundred foot waves come through this little valley. It's very cool. That's cool. We digress um, very quickly. Sorry. Yeah. No. No. I well. I mean, I gotta. I mean, I, I'm also just fascinated about the oil rig life. I mean, it's yeah. like I'm kind of getting like a I'm getting like an Armageddon flashback here. But like when you look at like those oil rigs, I, 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 like, I know. I know. I know that rig. Do you? <laughs> That's Dude, awesome. That was like that. That was like couple miles off the shore like just as close as you could get and that was actually my company know. i mean i guess i guess they had to go film it somewhere right yeah and, and my company was the helicopter they flew out no way oh there we go straight tie now did you ever see any like crazy you had to see some crazy stuff when you're out there like there's some characters out there that are you know it's kind of like the fishing industry up here in the pacific northwest you know did you see anything crazy down there yeah it's it, louisiana is just like an island like it's like <laughs> It's one of my favorite states, but like it is so different than than everywhere else. Uh, really, really, really nice people. Like just the nicest can you get. Texas yeah. is very polite, but they're they're better than us, and you gotta yeah. you have to understand that. So Texas was a little bit different, and it really wasn't. There was definitely some characters out there, but it's they take it pretty seriously when it comes to you know like. I, I would talk to people, does anybody ever jump in the water? Cause you know, it's so nice and calm out there sometimes. And like, nobody even knows anybody that's ever happened to you. And like, you think that that would be something that would happen all the time. And we fished a lot, like just a ton of fishing. Um, they'd, they'd have to go drop those rescue little uh, pods. Yeah. Little yeah. Uh, life rafts that are all enclosed. They'd go drive those around a couple of times. And, like, the uh, like they do a test run and they'd launch it off the rig or whatever. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Make sure it's up yeah, to code. So, Yep. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was just some, some sporty stuff, you know, loading guys onto boats off of cranes and things like that. But for the most part, they, they all take it pretty seriously. Like nobody drank, there's no drugs. Um, yeah. it was, uh, it was exciting, but not for the ways that the rest of the world is exciting. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You never know. I just figured maybe there'd be some like uh, crazy stories out there, but it sounds like people are actually taking it pretty serious, which is good. Given, well, yeah, I, I guess one of the rigs, I, one of the rigs I was on before I was there, it, it was one, it was one platform attached to another platform with a big bridge and all the natural gas was coming through there. And it basically like had a huge fire explosion one night. And so like they all had to go down and do the little evac stuff. Um, so that would have been pretty sporty, but I never had to get, I, I always thank God I didn't have to get on a boat the whole time I was out there. Cause if you're on a boat as a pilot, it's a bad day. Yeah, yeah, you just don't want to do that. Yeah, that's um. Yeah, my, so it's funny. My whole family's. I'm the only one not born in Louisiana. So um, my. Oh really? And, yeah, so they're all born in Baton Rouge. You know, dad went to LSU. The whole deal. Um, my sister, uh, born in Baton Rouge, but went to Oregon State University as well. Um, nice. but no, I, I remember uh, my dad was in finance, and he would they would uh, they would fly out to the oil rigs for like audits and things like that outside off the because uh, they were living in New Orleans and they would fly out to the oil rigs and do like audits, sure. which I thought was like a crazy thing to do. So maybe that was like some of the piloting yes. I imagine you're used to taking people and just kind of being that shuttle back and forth. Yep, exactly. Yeah, I did a lot of that stuff. Yeah. Um, well, you brought up a good point about kind of just like fishing and hunting, like you guys were fishing off the rigs, things like that. Um, like what, what did that, did you kind of get 
more opportunity down there in the south to just do a little more hunting and fishing and things like that like kind of get back to your roots well it's funny i did more hunting when i was up here before i left um but down there i once i was done you know at whatever three o'clock in the afternoon i you can either go watch tv or you or work out or go fishing so i just go drop a line and i did that i mean my hands would literally be bleeding just because um and they're i mean they're, they're big fish and they just work you out and it's it's exhausting, but it was fun. You never know what you're gonna pull up, and they have I mean sharks and crevalle and amberjacks and just all kinds of stuff. Well, I think that's like so different. Like you know, especially being in the Pacific Northwest, what you can go. You, I mean, you can you can do you know you can go fishing, but typically it's like you know you're gonna go salmon fishing, or maybe you're gonna go off the coast or something like that. Like we do a lot of crabbing and those things. But I'm I'm so envious of the South of how they can go out and you just I mean you can just get a boat and kind of go out and catch all your you know all these great fish and be able to you know kind of just that, have dinner that, ready that, for you after a day of fishing yeah that, that's that's my dad he's a huge salmon fisherman and I, i'm pretty sure he's disappointed in me because i'm not like i finally just told him <laughs> i was like i no, i'm not interested because you go out all day to maybe get one fish yeah and yeah down there it's you know five minutes and you got something maybe just throw it back and then and, i mean it's almost you know it's not every cast or every drop but it's pretty frequent yeah it's much exactly. more diverse fish too like you and depending on seasons and and the tracking of all the fish because they migrate throughout the whole area you can get you know really cool like tuna or um yeah you know, one of the coolest things i saw in florida when i was living there was the sharks migrate and the the ocean they're just tra- chasing this like group of fish and it just goes from like the silver to yeah. like bloody red and then you just see all of the sharks just cruising i mean it's like insane to watch it's really cool yeah, that was when uh, our big thing was if you got a fish, you generally had like you kind of knew which range you're in for like snapper or jacks or something. And then you'd, you'd try to get them up before the sharks would get them because yeah, yeah. sharks would come and peel half your fish off. And, you, oh. and then you can't really throw it back in a humane way. I guess it no, is. You're, not, you're, feeding, you're feeding the environment. Yeah, you're just encouraging <laughs> the sharks more by throwing more back. <laughs> yeah, I always, I always get interested in those YouTube videos of like those giant groupers that hang around the, the rigs. So I got, I got a video of, it wasn't me, a guy rigged up like a, like a, I think it was like a leaf spring on a garage door motor and like a line. <laughs> and he, he caught like a four, they weighed it was like 450 some pounds. Um, he actually, he said he felt bad. He goes, they, they cut it up, which I think it was probably illegal to catch one of these big Goliath groupers. Um, oh. And, but it was all exploded with a swim bladder and all that. And he yeah. goes, we got like, he goes, we got like 80 pounds of meat out of this 400 pound thing. And he's like, I feel bad yeah well you live and you learn and then yeah. that whole swim bladder thing it's like once the sl- swim bladder's out you're kind of you know it's, it's try tight. yeah try to pop it but yeah yep, it's exactly stuff. yeah so let's uh let's move on to where where you kind of you, you said it earlier on you liked woodworking because you know your dad would show you how to build things in the i guess like the the puzzle of trying to figure out how to do something where did you where did you really see word working become more of a hobby rather than just functional building to like building sure. artistic pieces? Um, was that when, was that because of your wife? Was that an inspiration or how did that happen here? So um, it really happened when uh, from the Gulf, I got a job flying back in the Northwest for the air ambulance life flight. And that's when I got that seven on seven off schedule. And we also moved into a house that had like a 1500 square foot garage. And so I'm like, I gotta, I gotta do something with my time. And I started building little things. I wasn't very good at it, but got slowly got better. And my wife, he, eventually she goes, you should, you should sell some of this stuff. I'm like, I should. And so that's when, you know, we started making a couple of things trying to sell. Yeah. So and your wife has a, a, a long history of her family being in the furniture business, right? Yeah. That's yeah, right. Yeah. Um, you might know uh, JP. The uh, her family owns Bedmar. Her dad started. Uh, it's a local furniture mattress company. They have yep. thirty-seven stores. They they have stores yep. in Hawaii now too. Um, just Oregon and Hawaii, but they've uh, he built it up from nothing. And she graduated in marketing from Oregon State. Also, she went to work for a different company, and finally, Dad convinced her to come work for him. And so she's kind of does everything that the owner doesn't do. So she just completely runs the company but yeah she's a pretty good resource for me to have when it comes to you know i didn't know anything about websites or you know really social media or anything that she, and so right. she was able to help me out with a ton of that stuff 
and it's cool to see like that she has the influence into the furniture business and i would say you're probably i mean maybe did when you started were you like the demographic of who's shopping at her store and now now you're really catered to like this is a statement piece of your home like what you're building is not like it, it is a, it's a truly piece of art it, you could either hang it on a wall or you could eat at it as a table but where did yeah, you start it's, uh, the yeah, there's definitely not a lot of overlap between like her, her furniture stores and mine now, um, whereas maybe there was more at the start. But uh, yeah, I, I, I slowly just started um, once I kind of found my niche of making like a little bit higher end items, I just kind of kept raising my prices. And then as I raised them, I'm like, well, they should probably be pretty nice if they're if I'm getting this much money. And I've kind of just continued that path of you know sourcing better, and better material and, you know, trying to make them, you know, more closer and closer to perfect. You yeah. fooled me if it's close to perfect because they, they look pretty darn good, especially yeah. with uh, the photography they put up on your website. So I'd say you're there's doing always, there's always something you can you can do better. One hundred percent. Yeah, but there is, and it's like, I, well, I mean, I like about your videos too. I mean, you kind of like you kind of own up to your mistakes. You're like, hey, here's something. Like you kind of like people can grow with you if you've been, you know, if you're watching long enough, or if you, even if you're just getting into it. Like you kind of just own up and say, like, hey, here's some of the things that can go wrong. Here's how you can avoid it. Maybe there's a mistake here, but it's kind of a Bob Ross moment. You know, you kind of got to just work through it um but when did when did you start to do I mean obviously epoxy has been like a big deal but like how did you even because most people maybe wouldn't have thought of getting into like building you know tables or custom furniture with epoxy so how did like where where did that come about I I, I don't know specifically I know I, I, I certainly wasn't the first person or one of the first few people to do it it wasn't like it was now um but I remember thinking, or I told my wife, I go, Hey, I want to try to build one of these tables out of wooden epoxy. And she's like, cool. And so you guys probably yeah, don't all right, know see, you, see you next, see you after the weekend. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> and so I, I went and I bought some epoxy and it was like 50 bucks, which was a lot of money for me to like, you know, potentially waste on a project. And, and I bought some wood that was pretty crummy. That was like 60 bucks. And so that was, I'm all in now, like hundred and some bucks for a <laughs> table. And I poured it all in there. I taped it underneath, which was, I did everything wrong and first it started all leaking out and my wife's watching me and she's like seeing me i like, try to like paste this tape back in <laughs> and then finally i get the leak stopped and it starts smoking and i'm like and she's looking at it and it's like hardening like as we're watching it and it's supposed to take you know long a lot, lot longer than that to harden right and it starts smoking and it starts cracking it's like a time lapse of like the desert drying out and i was she's like is that gonna catch on fire i'm like i don't know and finally she, she pulls up the, uh, the can, the epoxy that I'm using, which was not made for this type of stuff. And she's like, did you even read the instructions? I'm like, no, like <laughs> pour, pour some epoxy. That'd be fine. Why would I? Yeah. <laughs> Apparently you can't use boat epoxy to pour it like an inch deep. So that was my first lesson. Wow. Yeah. Brush on epoxy is not, uh, not made for that. That that's awesome. No, no it's not. That's hilarious yeah. too. And I really do agree with what JP said about your channel, which I, as I was watching videos today, you know, things that there's one video where you were talking about um, pouring black or, or colored epoxy inside of things, and you finished it with a different style epoxy. Um, and, and you talked about like, when you pour them, you know, this one, you use a torch to get all the bubbles out because of but but because of how it's, I don't know, the, the chemical balance to it. This one has is more prone to bubbles. And I liked how like you clearly had made a mistake with bubbles in the past and you but you're teaching all these people and i feel like youtube people come to watch not only in the background having your videos on because it's beautiful to watch the the progression yeah. of something being built but you're also coming because hey i've seen this live edge trend with a river through it i want to do it and you give them what not to do potentially and where they could fall into a trap and i really i really yeah. did enjoy that through it because yeah, it made I, me uh, want to go build a table yeah, I, I think there's a uh, a lot of people and probably including myself early on and have to look at some other videos that do try to hide those things because we're embarrassed, you know, we, we, we want to act like an expert, we want to be Bob Vila up there. Yeah. And how can we be an expert if we show people if we're failing as we're doing this and then what I what I kind of learned was um, sorry, a little side tangent I, I also sold cars and they told me when I sold cars, they're like, if you tell your your customer one truth, like you can tell them seven lies. So if you tell them, <laughs> don't buy this, if, if you tell them, don't buy this car, then they're going to go like, oh, wow. Like, you know, like that, that car's a piece of junk. Go, let me show you these ones. Then they're going to be like, oh, wow. He could have tried to push that on us. And that's, 
kind of try not to do too many lies, but that's kind of the whole thing with woodworking is, you know, if you own up to this and they go, wow, we should probably believe the other things he says because he told us that he messed this and this and this up. Yeah, and it's much, it's just much more human too. You know what I mean? Like we all, you know, you're going to come, you're going to, like I, I started uh, making like sourdough from scratch like three years ago, right? And it's like, I can't tell you how many bricks I had to make to get to like a edible loaf of bread. You know what I mean? And it's like you, yeah. you, especially with woodworking, it's a lot of times maybe it's irreversible, but maybe there's some ways you can fix it. But it sounds like, um, I mean, it, it, from my perspective, it's nice to see like to get that more like human touch, like, Hey, listen, people make mistakes. Here's what you can do to avoid them. Um, I, I don't know. I, I just think it's a better way to go rather than saying, Hey, here's a perfect, you know, thing every yeah. single time. It's, it's almost like Instagram these days where it's like, really like your life's not as good as your Instagram seems. And it's like, you kind of say, Hey, listen, we're working hard. It's tough. There's a lot of variables that go into making this. Um, but Hey, I'll follow me yeah, along and, and see where, and, I'm, where and, I'm messing up. Yeah. And, and any real woodworker, makes mistakes that I, I people will comment pretty regularly there's an old saying that's something to the effect of um like the skill in woodworking comes from fixing your mistakes not necessarily not making them like it's not mm -hmm. it's only a mistake if you can't fix it type of thing and yeah I, i'm usually pretty good at being able to find some sort of work around to the problem and people i think were like that because like oh wow if i have that problem now i know how i might be able to fix it yeah and it goes back to the sentiment that your dad taught you when you were a kid right how do you build a shed you just figure it out right when you're building when you're pouring uh epoxy or you're burning a table or you're doing something and something's going wrong you're just like i've got to just react and make it work and figure out how yeah. i can make this do i do, do i need to make the table smaller do i need to change a dimension like you're kind of working through that and and so what was the change from your building furniture in your 1500 square foot you know now garage and then selling furniture where did you determine hey i should put this on youtube and like make a channel and create a brand and go through all of these changes or was it like hey i'm gonna make a i got a gopro you know just make a video like how did that come uh, about yeah yeah i think uh, i think i just decided to, I, at that point instagram was going pretty well i was probably you know 30 40 000 um and i was like maybe i should do youtube and i didn't have any idea what I was doing my first so it's actually you can't find it I have more than 88 videos up or out because my first video was actually 10 videos because I didn't know how to edit videos I didn't know how to splice <laughs> clips together oh my. so it's like a bunch so, of two minute videos one minute videos pretty much or, yeah they just help, yeah that's hilarious yeah, and I had like all these comments of people like because they actually got some views I got like 10,000 views on some of them and uh someone's like why didn't you just make one video <laughs> like I don't know how <laughs> that's well, hilarious it, it seems like you've yeah. definitely learned from that that as well and and so you start making videos and and the first video on the channel that's visible today is uh the diy fest tool quick clip clamp which i really yeah. i did i thought it was awesome because fest tool is like the brand to have um in the woodworking community especially their track saw i'm so jealous of anyone who has one um and like it, it is like you want to have good clamps in especially the woodworking that you're doing. So you're showing everyone how to make it for a good price. So, so, so I, got, I got a full disclaimer. I, yeah. I, I totally ripped that. I totally ripped that video off of somebody else. Like somebody else did that. And I was like, I'll make a video because this guy did a video. Like, it seems cool. Like maybe I can make that. So I don't have a lot of pride in that video, but yeah, that's uh, um, something I did and they worked okay, but no, I wouldn't, I don't want to hang my hat on that video. But that's where you started, right? So when when did you when did you make the choice to change your direction of the channel to go from that to then building a live edge mirror to then the table to the stop? You you there are a couple times in there where now I feel like it's mainly woodworking, where uh -huh. early on you were taking maybe some inspiration from those in the the paths and doing some DIY sure. or or best finish yeah. or you know kind of you know those yeah. kinds of. Uh -huh. I, I was just telling my friend who was talking about starting like a finance YouTube channel. Um, I was like, I'm so jealous of you because you can do whatever you want and nobody's going to care. Like you can, you know, he works in like education too. So he can do stuff on scholarships and this and this. And I'm like, you can put 10 videos out on 10 different topics. And if one of them hits, maybe kind of, you know, go that direction. Whereas I can't make a video about, you know, fishing now you know or i can't make a video on you know something else because i'm fairly well set and it's getting so directed that now i you know it has to be a very specific part of woodworking you know almost these project builds exclusively 
And so it's fine. I, I like it, but I think it's fortunate when you're starting out to have the flexibility to do a bunch of different topics. Have you ever thought of doing a second channel where, you know, like, I don't know, like Matt did like off the ranch and, and things like that, where he, like he brought his family in and is doing hikes and that kind of stuff. Is that like a potential thought process with black tail? Yeah, I, 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 I thought about that, but I'm pretty much dead set against it now. It's, I, it's just so much work to build the one channel up to try to do that again. Um, yeah. And then to have a channel with a thousand subscribers, you know, it's like, why would I even put a video out on that channel that's going to get, you know, a few hundred views? Yeah, yeah, there's also, you know, what's the exit strategy? What's the long term play for Blacktail? And, and you know, you never know sure. where it could go. But yeah, I know I mean, Mr. Mr. Beast has a bunch of channels and he seems to be doing all right. Yeah, he seems to be doing okay. The Beast Burger, haven't tried it yet, though. Um, so, all right. So, you, you start putting videos up about two years ago um, that we can see, right? There's clearly. Yeah, it, it wouldn't have been that much ones. before that. A couple of hidden ones that he won't show the public. Yeah, well, maybe they'll, <laughs> yeah. maybe they'll come back. Maybe they'll come back. It was mostly just, it was Bossel Wood Train Flutes. That's the channel before. I'm just telling you right now. <laughs> Guarantee it. That's right. That's right. Um, but the the first video um, that really hit that kind of was like, oh, wow, this could actually be something was the, actually the second epoxy build video I did. My first one actually did okay. It got like 50,000 views or 30,000 something. And I thought, that's fine. And then um, I almost wasn't going to make another one because I'm like, I've already done an epoxy build. Who wants to see two of those? And now that I have, you know, 30 of them, you know, it's kind of <laughs> changed a little bit, but I did that dining table build and it got like 5 million views and it was like, whoa, like that was where I went from 500 subscribers to, you know, 20,000 or something like that. Right. And, and what, so I'm looking at your channel right now um, on my screen over here. And so the DIY epoxy river table is the first name. And then, then the next name is DIY epoxy dining table. Do you think that because of the name dining table versus a river table and maybe why do you think that one took off versus the first one? I don't know. I, people, someone asked me about that fire table one that has, you know, 17 million views. They said like, Hey, no offense, man, but there's like way better, you know, woodworkers out there that do way cooler stuff with like better quality video. Like why, why did this one do so well? And I'm like, yeah, if I knew I'd have a lot more with 17 million views. So <laughs> what, what an asshole thing to say, by the way. Seriously. I get what he was trying to say though. Like, yeah. like I, I personally have better quality products that I put out than this thing. Um, but for whatever reason, like that's how you guys found me. Yeah. But it's well. also like, it's, it's hard with content too. I mean, I don't know, like you can go out to try to make something. It might just not be all there, but you're like, you know what? I'm still going to post it anyway. It's like, I'm not, I'm not going to throw away a whole week's worth of work just because it didn't turn out perfect or exactly like somebody else's who's got this one on a pedestal somewhere. Oh, I, 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 I threw away something two days ago because it's because of that I filmed everything and I got there and I was like, that's pretty ugly. I just threw it away. Dang, I never it make it to YouTube. Well, I think like, so you, there there are the woodworking community is very deep in in youtube like there is a lot of people and and i was uh, either listening to a podcast of you or you had it written somewhere that you took inspiration from the samurai carpenter to start your channel and kind of that that ry rhythm so looking at his content to where you are today do you see similarities in the choices that you've made growing your channels or like is he still part of your your watch list um, he's so he's kind of slowed down on youtube and yeah. i'm actually involved a little bit through the makers mob i don't know if you know them yep um kind of like a i don't know a, a private podcast and then you know they do plans and help, projects and stuff um he's a part owner in that with like i think his brother-in-law is involved too so he he's not doing a lot on youtube anymore um that i've seen anyway and I think what you're referring to is uh, he did his about me video. And instead of someone like staring at the camera and talking like intensely for 15 minutes, yes. he just put a bunch of cool, like building montages while he told his story. And I was like, yes. uh, I'd be way more comfortable with that. So that was, that was my big inspiration from him. Yeah. Okay. So that, that's, that's where, and that actually is a good segue. So like you're building your channel and that, that it is the video that I remember watching today is I quit. Right. And so you're building yeah. your channel and you do it for, a little over a year, 13 months. And at that point, you decide, I'm going to quit my job with Life Flight. And I'm going to go full time as a creator. Yet at that point, you still were kind of nervous at saying I'm a creator. Are you two questions? So like, 
you know, what was the driving force and what, where did you feel comfortable saying I can quit my career and go this route? And then are you more comfortable telling people that you make YouTube videos for a living now? Uh, I'd say more comfortable, um, not super <laughs> comfortable. Like it's actually, it's, it's finally to the point now where I'm like actually generating income, like, you know, an actual income from YouTube that I feel like I can say, yeah, like I'm a content creator. I'm a YouTuber. You still even hear this hitch in my voice. So I guess I'm not super comfortable with it. Yeah. But, <laughs> more um, self-justified though. Yeah. yeah. You, and you it, it's, well, when, when I, the back a little bit. When, when I made $8,000 my first year of flying, I still said I was a bartender. I didn't say I was a pilot because right. that's where my income came from. So that was kind of how I looked at it. So if, if I don't want to get into a whole thing with someone, I just tell someone I'm a woodworker. I make furniture. Um, and then, because if I say I'm a YouTuber to like a stranger, then they're like, well, yeah. uh, huh? You got to break that whole dichotomy down. Yeah. So um, I, I say, yeah, probably woodworker furniture most. And then if people I know, I'll be like, yeah, and I do a lot of content stuff. No, I mean, it, it is an interesting, you're not the only person that we've talked to who has the same kind of sentiment. It's like, yeah, it, it's just not what I, I see. And, and it, the reality is, your channel is a lot of, you know, people are purchasing their, their builds through you and you make content because of that. So technically, I guess the reality is you are a woodworker who just happens to have a camera as well. So yeah, pretty much. So uh, 88 videos, 760,000 subscribers, 83 million views. Nice. Um, just, just a little over. You have 16 videos with over a million views. You have five videos over 5 million views. So that's wild huge. numbers. Yeah. Uh, one video at 17 million views, which we kind of roughly talked a little about. So you, you start making videos and very quickly you get your first million view video. What is that? how does how does that feel what is it like getting to that point and getting that validation through um it was probably a little different for me because i never like i didn't know why i was doing a youtube page i just thought maybe i'll get some clients might see it or something but i didn't really know why i was doing it so i feel like it would be different if my goal was to be a full-time youtuber mm -hmm. you know because you're like trying and trying and trying and like finally have that breakthrough so it was really cool. Like it was, it was really exciting. It's that I don't want to play it down at all because I was definitely like refresh, you know, refresh showing my wife and she said, that's great. It's great. <laughs> uh, so no, I was, I was super pumped about it. And then it's kind of like, well, what now? Cause but actually, so I didn't even, I didn't even monetize that video until it was over 2 million um, because I thought ads would hurt my channel. I just wanted to grow my channel and until I talked to someone and they're like, no, dude, you got to monetize. Like everybody's yep. used to ads. So um, yeah, didn't make any money off it for a long time. What's what's also like unique, I think, about your channel. Um, okay, so there's your you know your conversion rate, like it's your it's your amount of subscribers to how many people watch it, um, which is a, a huge huge number. But your engagement is crazy. Um, I remember the dining room table, I think it was that you did recently, the custom one that you drove up to the guy's house. I remember it was like a couple of days in and uh, I was telling Mike, I was like, Hey, we got to get this guy on the podcast. He's like, it's interesting. I was like, but I was like, go look at the comments. And there was like 26,000 comments in like a few days on there. And I was like, the engagement is insane. And whether they're yelling at you and saying like, Hey, just play music. And you're like, no, you can just mute it and play music on your own browser, which I thought was hilarious, by the way. Yes. Um, I love that piece. You're like, yeah, well, guess what you can do. You can open up another tab and you can play your own music over it. That was fantastic. But like your engagement's crazy. So like, what do you think? How do you, what do you think that I get? Like, I mean, that's so many comments to go through. Like what, sure. what's up? Um, I mean, I don't well, really know where to go with it. Cause it's like, how do you, you can't respond to everyone. Like you might be able to go in and like a couple of them or chat a couple of times, or do you just stay out of the comments? What's your, what's your theory there? So, so I actually, I, I actually read every, I read, I read every comment and I actually try to go through and heart each comment just so some people know that I read it. If it's not a question I, anymore, I won't respond. I up until that video, like a month ago, I would literally respond. Like just, you know, if someone says love your work or whatever, I just say, you know, thanks Michael. Yep. And so I would respond to every single comment, which if anybody's watching this that like wants to like build their page and they have 50,000 subscribers and they say they don't have time to keep up with comments. Look at how many comments I have. And I was responding to everybody until like last month, like literally just saying thanks. And I think that helped 
a lot because people would go through and they'd be like, dude, like I look at this video from a year ago and you're still responding to people's questions. Like I'm subscribing. And I imagine there's a lot of people that are feeling the same way that aren't typing that out. So yeah. I think it's, it helps. And um, I also feel like people don't know how to, people don't know how to get people to comment on their videos. And so they try to force it. They say, Hey, like subscribe, but do this. And they haven't given you any reason to do it. They know that. Yeah, exactly. You smash that like button. And so I try to be a little more authentic about it. And just like I said in that, in that video, um, I said something to the effect of, uh, Hey, I need some feedback from you guys. Uh, I, would personally never have a wood countertop because I'm an animal. I can't take care of it, but yep. I really like yep. getting a lot of money because I got paid a lot of money for this table. So would you guys have a wood countertop? And so I say that. Um, and then at the end of my videos, I have a little segment where it's like kind of the word of the week. So if you say, if you say this word, if you start your comment with like my name, for example, then I'll know you made it all the way to the end of the video and I'll answer your comments first. And I think that's people have liked that. And so, um, just asking an authentic question of like, Hey, would you guys do this? Cause you know, I wouldn't, you know, would you? And I think people like that better than like just trying to fill up the comments to get the algorithm going. Yeah. So yeah. I want to pull the, the, the thread on what you said right there, because that, that was kind of how I thought you answered all of the comments was the word. Um, I want to ask like how that came about. And cause you're the only person who I've ever heard say like, Hey, if the word would is the first word in your comment, I will answer every one of those and engage with you. And I thought that was the only people you engage with. It is absolutely amazing to hear that you respond to every comment well, previously had responded. Yeah. So where yeah, did the I idea guess, to engage I, with the word? Big, big control well, F guy. What's that? Big control, control F guy. What's control F? Oh, that's where you can do find on the browser and say like, all right, I put in wood. And then oh, I'll go gotcha. find them all. Uh, no, so so I still go through and um, I'll answer everybody's question now. I just can't respond to everybody's comment. Like, so if they have a question of like, hey, I didn't catch the finish. Like, what was that finish? Or, you know, what grit do you stand to? I'll still answer those. Um, as far as the like secret word or whatever you want to call it, something I just thought of. And I'm actually curious to go, since you guys are pretty deep into YouTube, um, I don't know if I'm made that up or not so you guys haven't seen that anywhere else no you're the first so like what a lot of people on the show have said is like i either don't touch the comment section at all and i don't get down with it or they say like for the first you know 10 15 hours i engage with it or um david manning has a he, he david manning is very similar to where you are he's at like i don't know like 200 and something thousand subscribers and but he answers and talks to everyone he even yep. came up with like a a text number so if you have questions about cameras or things like that you can text him and he wow. answers it all the time he so he's on the same page as you it's like i think there's two fields of like i don't touch comments or i'm fully into the comment all the time yeah yeah, all, all in. Why not? I mean, I uh, when I sit down, like, you know, do the morning coffee thing and just like pull the phone out and I just rattle, rattle them out. It takes, yeah. I mean, the, that video when it went viral was really, really hard. Yeah, um, I can imagine. To keep up. But normally it's, you know, 20, 30 minutes in the morning, 20, 30 minutes at night and you're good. In a way, it's almost like a new, I almost, and I'm sure there's some smart people in digital marketing that are dealing with this, but it's like, you know, like, so CX in the world of digital marketing, customer experience is so big, but it's almost like YouTube, like, like you call it like viewer experience, like your viewer experience is, is, is so valuable to those who watch it. And as if you're a longtime subscriber and a big fan of a channel, your experience as a viewer is, is actually pretty impactful. I mean, I wrote like go bees on one of your videos like four months ago and I got a heart from you and I was like, ah, oh, this guy's really right. He's really ripping through these things. I, oh, I, I didn't and even say go beef back. I think you might have. I think you might have said go bees back because I don't know I'm how many are there in the I, comments. I, I, I always respond to a go bees. So if you're yeah, watching so this, I, <laughs> I put it in the email when I sent it to you. When I reached out, I was like, go bees. I'll see you alone. Yeah. Um, but no, I mean, like, I, I really think it's like a, it's almost this new. And I don't know, you know, maybe I just invented the term there, but it's like it's a it's the viewer experience. And it's like this interaction between you and the creator. Um, and you can sometimes you can tell when it's not genuine, like there's some people who have people who run their accounts and, you know, whatever. But um, I think that's us. I think it just speaks kind of volumes to the interaction that you get right now. And your conversion rates are huge. And there's people that are looking at your channel going like, what's what's the magic bullet here? How, how come he's, you know, so successful with his interactions? You know what I mean? 
Yeah, I just, uh, I, I say, res- yeah, respond to everybody, like, you know, as long as you can in terms of, you know, eventually, you know, so- something's going to give, if my page continues to grow, you know, it's going to get harder and harder. Um, but as long as you can, I mean, people, uh, they got questions, just just answer them. Yeah. yeah. And, and for just for those who are made it this far and are listening, uh, he has 700, oh, sorry, 17,305,673 views on his biggest video. And there is 10 comments under 30,000, uh, 21,000 comments, 20,990. Hold on, restate that one more time. Restate that one wait, more time for me. 20,990. So 10 comments under 21,000 comments on this single video. And I am literally looking through, I've scrolled probably seven times. Every one of them has a reply from you. But the other thing that JP didn't also talk about is your comment section is involved with other people. The people of your channel respond and create threads. I've seen at least four threads of there's, I'm looking at one that has 11 11 response. Yeah. So it's pretty cool to see that everyone in your community is so engaged with each other. It's really cool. Yeah, no, it's, it, it's, it's super helpful. I mean, I'll get people that will answer my questions correctly. You know, someone will ask, like, Hey Cam, how do you do this? And someone will respond. I'm like, yeah, you got it. And so you, you, a lifetime of almost, what is it? Just a little over two years now mm-hmm. on posting videos to the channel. And I, uh, I don't have any idea. Is that, is that, is that where I'm at? So September the channel, 16th, I think it was. Yeah, the channel right. started, I think, September 16th, but I think it was, it wasn't, two years was the first video post that, that is, that is uh, uh, visible today. Right. And so, and so you, you've averaged roughly 350, let's call it 350,000 subscribers a year. Um, or is that, is that like a slow growth and then you just ramped in the past, you know, year? Yeah, it's, 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 it's a little, uh. It's a little weighted. Um, yeah. Just in that that Kitchen Island video I did that um, I had, it's got whatever six million some odd views. Um, that one got me. I mean, I could tell you. I don't want to pull it up. Um, but that one alone got me like one hundred and fifty thousand subscribers. Wow. Yeah. And so, and like a hundred thousand in two weeks or something, you know, or maybe even less than that. So um, it's kind of kind of interesting. Is 30%, just over 30% of my subscribers come from two videos. Wow. That's crazy. That's crazy. And, yeah. and it's what what the the uh, burn table one and then what other videos? The draw. Yeah, the fire, fire the, the kitchen, the kitchen, kitchen island. island one. Wow. And and we th- I thought that the one that you that has 17 million views had great engagement. The one that you just posted on April 8th, um, has 26,800 nice. comments yeah yeah that one's got pretty pretty engaged with people it's amazing i mean it, it, it just uh, the one thing i love about youtube and why i think jp and myself are so involved in youtube is because it, it truly is a community and the, everyone inside of it loves watching and being part of it and you know it, it takes over what your what else media content you're bringing into your life and i think the benefit is like it, it truly is extremely positive from almost every sense of it and and you are one of those really easily positive channels that is helping people yeah. become better so i like that yeah, yeah. no I, I i try i try to be and it's been a it's it's been a, it's been a fun fun growth process and that kitchen island video was where i felt like i finally put like everything that i knew at least thought i knew about youtube like that i'm like okay i learned this from this video i learned this from this video you know, like the best way to ask for subscribe and the best way to show a mistake and the best way to talk about a project and that, you know, show a failure. And I was able to like finally put those all together in one video. And I think that was where all the success from that one video came from was um, I really do dive overly deep into all my analytics and like, you know, this video has less views than this one, but it has three times the subscribers, even if it's a smaller video. Like, what did I do better on this video that I didn't do in that video? And I would go through that and I'd listen and I'd, I'd watch it again and I'd read the comments and I'd find something where someone's like, hey, I really thought that was cool. That you said that you're a full-time content person now. And I'm like, oh, maybe I'll bring that up again. Yeah. yeah. And so That's awesome. I love that. 
thinking about like what videos you're putting out, looking at the analytics and the data, how do you determine what the next video idea is? Or is it strictly driven by um, what you're, you know, what you have from your clients coming in? Yeah, um, kind of fortunately and unfortunately, it is a lot of client driven, which I didn't particularly want to build that kitchen island when I first talked to the guy. I was like, yeah, like, I guess I can do it. And, you know, we kind of went through it and I was like, all right, I'll do it. And as I got going, I'm like, oh, this could actually be a cool video. But uh, so it is nice that I get forced into doing some things that I don't want to do uh, because a lot of times they have the best results. But really, I just, you know, try a lot of different things. And I, I thought that YouTube was just wacky, weird content. So I made some like weird stuff and it didn't do well, you know, all of the fire table is kind of weird and that one did pretty well. So <laughs> but it's just you know, it's weird just, enough just, to make you intrigued. Yeah. yeah. So I, I just, I wish I knew of what was the magic recipe, but I keep making videos on these like epoxy table builds just because I'm making a table. I'm like, might as well film it. And they keep doing pretty well. And it's like, you know, at one, one point, like, I feel like I, I keep thinking that I'm doing the same thing over and over again, but people keep watching them. Yeah. But I, yeah think I think they're all a little bit, like a little bit different too. Um, and you hey, can put it on back real quick. I'm going to use the yeah. restroom. Yeah, quick. go for it. I'm going to take a quick you can put it on the background, which I think I love about like the woodworking world is like, it's not, I can be involved in your channel, but I can also, you know, chime in and listen and just have it on kind of like a podcast, like hearing something happen. And then you're like talking about epoxy bubbling and using a torch. I'm like, oh, okay. I'm going to build this table this weekend. Let me come back to that and, you know, rewind it a couple of seconds and, and understand that. So, yeah. And I, and I think that that's something I'll, I'll some just now realizing is that it's not all people that want to learn how to make a table that are watching my channel it's you know i get so many comments of people like you know i have anxiety and i use your videos to fall asleep and i do this you know just it's just white noise to people and i don't i'm not offended by that and uh even though maybe i should be but it's uh it's these people that want to put on a how it's made episode you know yeah. like listen to mike rowe talk about how something's made and you're like i don't need to actually i don't want to start a spring factory but it's pretty cool learning how springs are made yeah yeah and then and then you wake up two hours later by accident and you're you know in the candy factory and if you want and to wait by the way them, those are my favorite viewers because they watch all the mid-roll ads so those yes. ones yeah those are yeah. Bad. And, and they watch the full ad and get the second ad because they're asleep so i i don't exactly. disagree those are those are great ones to listen to so what is of the projects that you've worked on and on or off of YouTube, what is the favorite project or favorite furniture you have built, piece of furniture that you have built? So pe people are going to think that, that I asked you to say this and we set this all up because <laughs> I feel I feel like I'm McConaughey on The Tonight Show here. Well, thanks for bringing that up because my movie coming out this week is really exciting and the best movie I've ever done. But this Thursday is my favorite piece. And I even say that in the video. So that's how you know I'm telling the truth is uh the video coming out this thursday is uh the favorite piece i've ever done wow and, and what the video what made it what made it your favorite tomorrow. yeah what made it your favorite was it like you you got pushed your limits outside of your comfort zone like what yeah what it, was, it was different um it was a dining table for myself for i guess my wife but for for us and she's always my toughest client and it's it's not an epoxy table which i've done a lot of epoxy tables and so i, I do like doing something a little different and she said that she wanted to have extension leaves on it. And I'm like, well, I don't want a table that's going to open up in the middle, like normal extension leaves. And she's like, yeah, but we entertain. I need more seating. And so I came up with a way to do like the continuous grain where you have a slab table and then the leaves are going to click in from the end and the grain continues with it. So I'd never seen that done before. And so I had to figure that out. And it was, it was a challenge, but, um, and I also, it was my first time in 88 videos shooting not on my iPhone. I've only ever shot on my iPhone and edited on my iPhone. Seriously? So I got a real, I got a real camera now. And so this was a, that was a big challenge too. That, that is a, it's weird how many people, it's not weird. I mean, what an iPhone has like a 4k resolution camera and it's fantastic. So what, why not? Mm -hmm. So that, I mean, that's it, is, it is crazy. Cause some people, we, we, we hear this all, time and time again, when we talk to YouTubers that are like, most YouTubers that are successful didn't, go out to become a successful YouTuber. They had something they're passionate about and they started building it. So if you're going in to build a YouTube channel to create content and spend $5,000 on cameras and accessories, like odds of you being successful probably aren't there because it's 
It's more about the, you know, what's, what's getting you there, what the content is. So that's, sure. I mean, it's crazy that you filmed with an iPhone. So what are you, what are you filming with now? I'm sure you got at least a little bit of budget for a camera over there. Well, that was, that was, uh, I've actually had a pretty nice camera for a while. Um, <laughs> I've, Don't I've, tell your viewers that. <laughs> well, I, I had a, I had a, uh, I like photography, so I, I could shoot photos and I'm, you know, very amateur level, you know, let's say, you know, no better than amateur, but I like photography. So I have a nice camera because I like buying tools. Yeah. You're like, and it's an A7S so, too. I guess I, I guess I could have used it for, for this. <laughs> uh, it was a Mark D or Canon Mark D4. So, uh, or 5D Mark IV, but the, uh, Nikon reached out and they're like, uh, Hey, do you want some gear and to do a sponsored video? And I was like, this is the push that I need to finally do it. Yeah. So um, I got a sponsorship through Nikon. And so I was, didn't have a choice, but to, to learn how to use this. So that's, yeah. uh, that's why I finally became a real YouTuber now this week. Wow. How was the, uh, yeah. How was the transition from uh, just using like, if you're, you know, other camera, I know going from camera to camera could be a little tricky. Like how, how did, how did the experience go? Nikon to or Canon to Nikon was really easy. I feel like they're very similar. Um, so I didn't really have any issues with that. Um, but just, you know, I had a lightweight tripod in my iPhone. I could just swing that thing everywhere. And now, yeah. you know, I got like a big heavy duty mm -hmm. video tripod because I got like an external recorder at an Atomos um, Ninja 5. And so yeah, it's cumbersome, you know, moving that thing around. And I was shooting everything in 4K and I was just filling up, you know, every hard drive I have, you know, faster <laughs> and faster. And so it, uh, um, I, you know, this one video was like five terabytes bytes of data so it was wow yeah my and next is this video gonna is gonna be like, is this gonna be like a pretty big yeah it's gonna take a while for the full full res to, to go through um is this gonna be kind of like your is this like a capstone project for you like are we looking at like 45 minutes an hour like how do you judge something like that it's for a, a it's, it's 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 just over 30 minutes my longest video ever okay yeah so I'm, awesome. I'm, I, I'm really curious i i think that sorry my dog just woke up and he's sitting here you see me um, looking down Riggs but, is getting some yeah. pets i like it yeah um but uh i'm curious to see how that's gonna go and how people respond to such a long video because i feel like people are watching more of this long content where they can watch it like a tv show now like you said put it on the background so i'm i'm hopeful that it does well but i also a little leery that might turn people off of seeing such a long video we'll see we'll see on thursday now this goes live on wednesday so all those listening all right. the next day you'll get to see there we go yeah um i, th I think people i mean people are gonna love it it's a, you have a loyal base and it's like for uh, you know for us who follow so many different youtubers um i don't know it's always nice to have it's, something it's, 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 it's not the it's not the loyal base i want it's it's everybody else yeah yeah the expansion yeah. well yeah. so we had a we had a guy um craig adams he's a he's a hiker and he actually was doing 10 to 15 minute videos. And then his subscribers continually said like, I want the long format video. And so he posted like four or five, three hour videos and people, really? it, it went really well for him. Really? And, yeah. Yeah. And so like, I think it's more so because they, he has music and is a little bit of different editing style, but it's like, him basically trekking through the woods or through these amazing backgrounds and just sure. showing that. And, and I think people just want it as a long form item in the background. JP and I both YouTube when we're at work, working on projects and things like that. And it, to me, it just is the great background noise. But also, like I said, when we were talking earlier, it's like, okay, this is, here's something I want to listen to. Let me bring it back, focus on it and get back to what I'm doing. Yeah. So. Yeah. 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 So, um, and it's, it's my same pace. It's, I, I talk a lot in these videos and so it's a lot of talking but um i i like I, I trimmed it down i could have done 40 minutes easy you know with this one so there's wow. there's, there's no there's no filler in there yeah no that's good i think that'll be awesome um did you notice when you went through the editing process i mean so it's gonna be a little bit different i'm not sure what you're using for editing um software wise but like as far as um how's you're using something new now. You're using new cameras. You're doing everything for, I imagine, almost the entirety of edit. I'd assume maybe you got some iPhone shots in there too. But like, did you notice any like, does this video stand out from like a quality perspective at all to you, or how does how does that? Oh look yeah, with no, the, it, it's it's night and day because I got a um, I got a two point eight lens on there, so it's yep. like very Real close. 
yeah cinematic looking and blurry background and that like sh- you know like you said the iphone is good but then when you see it like next to like a you know a big like professional camera lens i mean the lens for this is you know twenty five hundred dollars and so yeah. the quality the quality is just unreal compared to so i'm excited to be able to have this like good quality going forward um but it was it was a process getting getting it all in there Oh, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, I, you know, whenever, you know, everyone, we talk about it all the time, but it's like iPhones take great photos until you start to see like what real photos and videos look like through like a nice lens. Like if you're talking like a 2.8, what are you shooting? Like a, are you shooting like a prime 25 or what lens is it? Uh, 24 to 70. Okay. Got it. So yeah. So it's going to be, there's going to be some good, some good shots there. It's, it's sharp. It's like, it was really cool. And some of the, you know, the, the focus tracking, you know, you could, I could put it on the saw. So when I'm running the saw, like towards the camera, you know, yeah. staying focused the whole time. And um, yeah. there's all kinds of stuff that I'm sure I don't know yet, but it was, uh, it was cool. And I, th- I think it turned out pretty good for, for a first timer. Yeah. You got to get Peter McKinnon out there for a B-roll yeah. session. You know I, mean? I, know, I know, right? Yeah. That guy makes let, 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 let him know I'm available when you guys have mom. Uh, yeah, if we yeah if we can get him on, um, we will. Vice versa, yeah. if he comes to your house, just let yeah. us know, let him know we're a little yeah. podcast. Yeah, we and we'll call him out here. Um, just type Peter McKenna in the comments. Um, and we'll get him on. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, no, I th- I think you you're in a great space too. I think um, especially in this world now where like we have moved. I'm not saying like I would say we as like a collective of people who are interested in what you do. Um, is just like moving away from mass production, you know, off the shelf, Ikea, whatever it might be, furniture, it doesn't matter. Like we're all kind of into the art and craft of things, whether it's bread making, pizza dough, um, you know, it could be like you're, you know, obviously doing woodworking or any sort of DIY projects. Like I feel like you kind of hit like while the iron's hot on this whole DIY, people are trying to kind of say, hey, I'm, I'm working from home now. I've got this space. Maybe I should start building some stuff and learn some things. Like, have you seen a pretty big uptick since, uh, I guess, quarantine? I mean, what, we've been a year and a couple months yeah. in? Yeah, yeah. So I quit my job in March, like March 1st, basically, of 2020. So that was like right when COVID is like, it was around, oh. but it wasn't really like shutting everything down. Yeah. And so it went full throttle then, which you know, as many bad things about COVID, it was good for YouTube and everybody I know in, in YouTube was like, wow, like everything just exploded. And in part, like a friend of mine, the BYOT uh, channel, I don't know if you guys have seen him or not, but you know, his, like his, like how to grow a lawn channel, like, you know, also like exploded and how to build a fence, you know, exploded because everybody wants to know how to do that now. And so I, yeah, I think that that had a lot to do with, and I hope that we don't look back after this is all settled and go like, you know, 10 years from now, we're like, God, remember how easy the, the views were back then? Like, remember when I got 17 million views? So I'm hoping it's not a fluke and, you know, just a byproduct of, you know, everybody being home and uh, sitting in front of their screens. I think, yeah, I don't know. I think society's shifting though. So you're yeah. going to see more remote workers regardless. And I think I people are just, that this has only made cable companies get cut and youtube tv and all these other things and why do i need to pay for cable when instead of watching this old house for the 17,000th time i could go watch you or johnny brook or you know any of the other crap creators out there and figure out how to fix my house up and do these great activities or get fit and run with hella good you know and all that kind of stuff so we hope yeah it's yeah better. that I, I, I totally agree. And that's, that's my theory behind these longer content videos and uh, we'll, uh, we'll see how they, how they go. Yeah. I'm excited yeah. to see how it goes on Thursday. So uh, you, you at least have to, I'm going to put JP in this buggy of two views on, on Thursday. So two views. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. You're, All right. You get to a, a yeah. solid cause I'll watch the whole thing. So you're going to get the whole, you know, you're going to watch through. the, the, the mid, mid roll ads too though. Yeah. I'll watch the whole ad. I pay what premium. If put, like, so what if they put like I a four minute ad I, sure. I, I, I'm going to be, I, I'm, I hate to say this, but I'm going to be driving on Thursday. So I'm probably going to listen to it while I drive. So perfect. Yeah. It, the, the whole ad, I, like I won't it. even skip for you. I'll make that happen. Why, why don't people, that's, that's, like, I guess, that's like two cents. That's hey, perfect. I, so I got to ask a question though. Cause like, I don't know this. Cause like, so I pay for you. I've been paying for YouTube premium forever. I haven't had ads in a minute. So uh, how does that, uh, I guess so that's a whole nother wormhole to go down, but I assume it's just factored in already. Uh, all, to- all, all, all I see is, it, which I rarely break into the actual, like I'll look at how much I made in a month, but I don't look into like how I made the money, but yeah. it'll show me like a YouTube premium 
you made X amount of dollars from this and then ad revenue, you made X amount of dollars. So they, they yeah. figured it out. And who knows uh, yeah. how fair it is um, or not. There's a, I've got another, I've got a question for you and it's personal for me is when can I get a custom black tail um, studio cutting board? Oh yeah. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's not going to happen. I don't, uh, yeah. All, like, I don't do cutting all, boards. I don't do cutting boards. All the small things anymore. I just say no. It's just like, yeah. yeah, there, there's so many much better cutting board makers out there that would be so much less expensive than me that yeah. uh, it would be criminal for me to try to charge someone um, to, to actually make them a cutting board. And it would be criminal of you to allow me to do it for free. So it's just a lose-lose either way. Yeah. So, yeah. But it would be a great video for JP's uh, JP's channel about this $1,300 yeah. uh, black tail uh, cutting board. Yeah, curly, curly walnut. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. And you're like, and it's not as nice as this other one that's like 120 bucks, but all right. Yeah. No, I... No, you uh, the, no, we love what you do. It's it's awesome. And and the bigger projects are it's like, how do you take them on? And like watching you kind of craft these ways of like, all right, well, I don't know how to flip these things over. And like you're just like, all right, I guess I'm just gonna figure out a new way to kind of like maneuver and position these tables and flip them over and deal with all this, you know, that you have to. It's pretty it's pretty crazy to go through. But I think the scale of what you do is kind of also what makes it fun. You know what I mean? Because yeah. it's not it's not just a yeah. uh, you're going in there with a lot invested or a lot of customers money invested out of the gate. So it's, uh, the stakes are high. So everyone's watching kind of like, all right, how's this thing going to end up? It, <laughs> What's it, gonna happen? Yeah. Like, you know, I haven't, I haven't had to, I haven't totally lost a, a, a table yet, you know, where I've had to throw away a slab and start over, but it's always in the back of my head. If you know, it's the wor worst case scenario. Yeah. And right yep, now definitely. it is not the most cheap thing. So, um, yeah. So my final JP, do you have any questions before you do the rollout? No, I mean, I probably do, but I don't yeah. know. I, I just, I mean, great channel. I've been, I've been a subscriber for a long time. It's great to get you on, you know, got to love the Oregon state alum. Um, so Jeez. no, that's, that's, we'll that's have to good. Do, we'll have it to do a, a, another episode together on a nice, we'll, we'll like do an Airbnb out in uh, Oregon beach. Cause I know you enjoy a nice cloudy beach day being from Oregon and, uh, and so I, I enjoy the Oregon coast and we'll have to catch up at, you know, one and a half million subscribers or something like that and see what's changed, yeah. what, if you've cracked the algorithm by then or not. Um, so but my only question about YouTube um, before JP rolls it out is like, what do you watch on YouTube? Yeah, um, that's a great question um, because, you know, even a year ago, I feel like I didn't watch a lot of YouTube and, and now it's my whenever I go work out, I just, instead of TV, I put on YouTube. And if there's somebody interesting, you know, that I want to follow along, like, you know, I like a industrial maker. He's a, um, Chicago. Man. Yeah. Yeah. Mike um, is the man. I, yeah. I like his content and I, and I watch his, but I try to find inspiration for, you know, where my channel, you know, could maybe be. So I, you know, I'll watch a lot of Peter McKinnon. I like, I love photography stuff, you know, and I don't know anything about it. So I've been watching a lot of photography tutorials, a lot of video editing tutorials. Um, those are more out of just necessity because I don't know how to edit, but, uh, yeah, when I'm in the gym, I like to watch, you know, I'll watch a woodworking project, but I try to find somebody in another vertical that I might be able to learn something like a Peter McKinnon or someone like that. Yeah. There, yeah. One of the, one of the coolest things that I heard when John Hill was on our channel, um, he actually, he, he felt like he was getting stuck in the, you know, watching so much skateboarding content. And then he was just drawn to like do the same thing that all the other skateboarders are doing. And he actually broke out and like started watching real estate videos and all these things. And it opened this major section in his channel that was like, he started like visiting skate parks and saying, visiting a $5 million skate park. And people are like, Oh, whoa, what's that like? And it, the, the benefit of staying outside of your realm is you get creative outlets to understand and grow your channel. Yeah. And that was when I, when I started, I like had, a, you know, a handful of guys that were at the time, you know, pretty big in YouTube that I was like, I need to try to be like them. And then as I started to like pass them, I was like, well, God, maybe I've been looking at the wrong guys. Like maybe I should be, you know, looking, like you said, these guys in real estate or finance and you'll, you'll find little things of like how they ask for a subscriber. You know, I, I actually watch a ton of Mark Rober, you know, the big, oh. you know, one of the biggest guys yeah. in the world. And he's like, God, he's just great at everything he does and so sincere. And, yep. you know, he has a simple, please consider subscribing, you know, so didn't even say it in his videos. And so I think there's so much that, you know, I can learn or other people can learn from these like really, really big channels that are doing it so well. 
the only man to crack the YouTube algorithm in my mind. 12 videos a year, and he averages like 15, 20, 30 million. Views. Unbelievable. It's insane. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's, it's, it's unreal. He would be a dream yeah. to come on. If you meet him, you know, have, have him holler at yeah. him. I think, uh, him I, in think, the I think you can, I think if you, you know, you swap a video, a B roll video for, uh, a table or a desk for Peter McKinnon, you might have yourself a little something there. Cause I know, man, he loves all that handmade stuff, you know, yeah, rings, yeah, wallets, and all that he stuff does. that he did. I mean, you follow him, you know, all that stuff. So, so this is just a call out for that. Um, we're I'm just ready. facilitating people here, you know? Yeah. Um, but no, I mean, it, it's cool. And like, as you said, you, you, you know, maybe you're doing other things. I don't know if you, I, I, I don't know if I've ever seen like your wood buying process or how you go about those things. Have you ever yeah. thought about those, those type of uh, like videos? I, I, I did, I did a, a video on that and I have some blogs on that um yeah and i actually yeah i even did a a a little series on the most expensive slabs i bought and they it did pretty well that video got some views so yeah i'll I'll continue to do stuff like that yeah awesome um well yeah i think that's i mean that's kind of it so the, the way we'll roll this out um is basically well typically i would have a you know i've got a bit of a a drink here but we'll kind of we'll kind of give you a little bit of a cheers and say thanks for coming on and um if you can just tell everyone what's going on obviously we got this video that's coming out thursday this is going to be big this is great for you so tell tell the viewers uh you know a where to follow you you know um where to watch you where to find your products where to look into your you know your your content if you will um and then tell us about what you got coming up and what we can expect from you going out okay Cheers to you, Cam. I'll be drinking. You talk. <laughs> Cheers. Uh, yeah. If you guys want to check out my channel, youtube.com slash Blacktail Studio. If you just Google Blacktail Studio, all my pages will come up. Uh, I have a website. If you if you do want some custom furniture, you can reach out to me through there. Um, I'm really good at responding to YouTube comments, like I mentioned. So if you have any questions, hit me up on YouTube. Instagram, I do a lot there. Um, I'm even on TikTok. So, so hit me up anywhere. And all of that will be in the show notes below. And uh, I'll go back on Thursday and I'll put the link to the video for Thursday too. And I'll tag it as Cam's favorite video. So um, I appreciate your time, man. I'm, I'm super, super stoked to have you on. I think the story to get to YouTube was very interesting, but it seems like you're on a path to crack. And I love that you you go back into the analytics. So everything's below for us. And uh, thank you so much for being part of our community. Yeah, thanks for having me.